Hi, welcome to 45th Street. I hope you've come here looking to learn more about the Lord. It's my prayer that something that will be said on this channel will give you more of a desire to be a part of his church family. I invite you to come visit us at our physical location at 7600 Division Avenue, so over in the East Lake community, or you can continue to find out more about us at 45bc.org. Well, here comes the sermon. My prayer is that it's a blessing to you. God bless you, and take care. My Lord, when we commit ourselves to any place in God's kingdom that you can serve other folks, it's a ministry. It's a ministry. If you'll commit yourself, it can be your job. You can turn your job into a ministry. All right. You just got to be willing to help and do God's will from that place that he has you in. I'm watching, I'm watching, watching and, and loving as our choir grows into just folk wanting to sing into a ministry. I'm watching that as an evolution taking place. It's, 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 it's seen in the song selection. It's seen in the way we present the song. I love the choir when I don't see the choir. That's, that's the best time when I'm not paying attention to who is singing. That's, we are gone to a whole different level. Now I want you to do your best, but remember y'all, it ain't about us. It ain't about us. It ain't about us. Awesome job. It's interesting that this song was selected today. Having not had a conversation with the members of the choir prior to this, it's interesting that on this, this post-Easter uh, Resurrection Celebration Sunday, that they would pick a song by Shekinah Glory, which is the name of the group that they first sang this song, Shekinah Glory. How many of you know what Shekinah Glory is? I ask you that. No, no problem. No problem. But we do talk about it in Bible study. I just want to go ahead and put that plug in. <laughs> there are a few instances in the Bible where you can see Shekinah, the Shekinah glory. All right? The Shekinah glory is the presence of God. And it's the amount of presence that we can, I think, tolerate. There's an instance in scripture in Exodus when Moses is at the Holy of Holies. And the Bible says, and God's spirit rested on the tent of meeting. That, that, that spirit manifested in itself. If you and I had seen it, it may have resembled a cloud on the Holy of Holies or just billowing smoke. Um, that's the glory of God. That's as much of it as you and I can possibly see and still live. And then, interestingly, on this Sunday, this post-resurrection day Sunday, um, when Jesus came back after he had been resurrected and he met with his disciples and he was giving them their commission, the great commission as we find it in Matthew chapter 28, the Bible says, and a whole lot of preachers, Reverend, 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 Reverend Johnson, you said before, and he stepped on a cloud and went on back up into heaven. Well, that cloud that he stepped on was referred to as the Shekinah glory. All right. that, 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 that's what it said. He was hidden from our presence by a cloud. That's the, the glory of God. And so I think that was very, very appropriate. And it's also appropriate. We finished our series that we have been in for the last four or five weeks so on the Bible movie, the Bible movie. We were part of the 80 million plus people who were watching it. And that, that's good. That's a good thing. I enjoyed every episode. And I look forward to bringing it here for those of you who haven't seen it so that you can view the Bible here. It's going to have to be done over a few settings because I don't think you want to sit up and watch seven and a half hours of a show in one, one setting. Although, um, we'll, we'll set it up so that it's uh, bite-sized portions for you. 
but it's a wonderful, wonderful retelling of the Bible story. Did it get everything right? No. No, I couldn't. you couldn't condense everything that went on in the Bible in seven hours. That's impossible. Plus, we don't have limitless resources. You have to do what you do with the resources that you have. But I think they did a great job, a great job, and I thoroughly enjoyed it. And there are a lot of teaching, teaching points from it. Joya, you got a clip for me today. It's the week after Easter. Some call this day a low Sunday, low in attendance, low in energy, a religious hangover. But this week is not a low Sunday, not to you and not to us, because we recognize that when the risen Christ burst forth from that tomb, he went on the move and didn't stop moving. Easter kept happening. In fact, nearly one week after his resurrection, Jesus presented himself alive to Thomas, the most famous skeptic in all of history. And he said to him, here I am, go on. Touch my hands, examine. Take your finger and put it in my side. Do what it takes to find belief. Thomas responded, my Lord and my God. Easter kept happening. Easter is not just a one-time phenomenon. The redemptive power that came alive in Christ's resurrection is as powerful and alive today as it was then. When God works in and through our lives, Easter happens. When we invite the stranger, when we help the poor, when we visit the sick, clothe the naked, feed the hungry, or bring peace to those whose hearts are troubled, Easter happens. Whatever excitement and exuberance we experience on Easter Sunday is alive and present and available every day, every hour, every second. Low Sunday? I don't think so because Easter keeps happening. Yeah, it's a good one. It's a good one. Turning your Bible to Luke chapter 24. Luke chapter 24. I want to trade with you today. I'm going to read you a long passage of scripture, but I'm going to give you a short sermon. All right? That doesn't seem like it ought to be, but a long passage of scripture. I think you need to be acquainted with this. And I know there's a message in it. I know there's a message in this one. This uh, for you. I believe it'll be beneficial. Luke chapter 24. I'm going to start reading at verse 13, verse 13, and I'm going to read, well, I'll just stop when I stop, all right? Now, that same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. They were walking with each other about, they were, I'm sorry, they were talking with each other about everything that had happened. And as they talked and discussed these things with each other, Jesus himself came up and walked along with them. But they were kept from recognizing him. He asked them, what are you discussing together as you walk along? They stood still, their voices downcast. One of them, named Cleophas, asked him, are you the only one visiting Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened there in these days? What things, Jesus asked. About Jesus of Nazareth, they replied. He was a prophet, powerful in word and deed, before God and all the people. The chief priests and our rulers handed him over to be sentenced to death, and they crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. And what is more, it is the third day since all this took place. In addition, some of our women amazed us. They went to the tomb early this morning, but didn't find his body. They came and told us that they had seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. Then some of our companions went to the tomb and found it just as the woman had said, 
but they did not see Jesus. He said to them, how foolish you are and how slow to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Did not the Messiah have to suffer these things and then enter his, enter his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning him. As they approached the village to which they were going, Jesus continued on as if he were going further. But they urged him strongly, stay with us, for it is nearly evening. The day is almost over. So he went to stay with them. And when he was at the table with them, he took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and began to give it to them. Then their eyes were open, and they recognized him, and he disappeared from their sight. And they asked each other, did not our hearts burn within us while he talked with us on the road and opened the scriptures to us? Stop reading there. Reggie broke it out a few minutes ago question of the day for you today. I want you to bear with me as I labor in this thought today. Now that we found love, what are we going to do with it? <laughs> Just play the music. That's all. Yeah. Now that we found love, what? What are we going to do with it? Yeah. Yeah. I love that song. Listen, listen. The pomp and circumstance is over. The crying surrounding the crucifixion. The tears are still fresh on their faces. They're still mourning him. Go back to my scripture now. It said it in two places. This is the third day after the resurrection. I mean after the crucifixion. The third day after the crucifixion. The women have already gone to the tomb. They've already run away and given their report to the disciples. They've told him he's alive. He's not dead. The one we put in the tomb is back up again. I've seen him. I've spoken to him. Love is back. Yeah, love is back. Yeah, love didn't die in the tomb. Love is back. And yet, be bopping along. Two guys who had been around Jesus, they had seen enough folk who had gotten healed from him. They'd heard about enough folk who were at the banquet in the desert when he fed all of them. They'd seen enough of the miracles go on. They'd even stood and witnessed his trial and his crucifixion. Here they are bebopping along, and they're still stuck on Friday. Still talking about what Jesus was supposed to be. And they don't know that here he is walking along with them. They've been exposed to love the whole journey, and they don't know what to do with it. Some of us, some of us, have been exposed to love for a long time. And we really don't know what to do with him. Amen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. One of the scariest things, I was thinking about this as I was preparing this sermon, one of the scariest things is the day after you realize you found the love of your life. That's a frightening time. When you've been hoping for somebody, you've been looking for somebody, you're too afraid. I, I don't want to mess this up. I think she might be the one. I think. I think I like her. She, 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 she makes me happy. But I've been hurt before. And I don't want to put myself out there like this. Because if she steps on my emotions, I'm going to have some problems. And it's going to be hard for me to trust anybody again. But I like the way she smiles. And I like the way she makes me feel. And, and I like just being in her presence. And I'm looking forward to spending some more time with her. In fact, let me text her right now. I just want to be around her. I just need to be near her. She does some strange things in my life. She makes me better than I would naturally be. She makes me kinder than I would be under any other circumstances. And she helped me stop cussing when I want to keep cussing. She tells me to watch my mouth. I believe I found her. 
I, I believe she might be the one. And when I get the courage to confess my, my feelings to her, that becomes a dangerous point. The day after, she knows I love her. The day after, she tells me she loves me too. The day after, we got this new love thing and I don't know what to do with it. I don't know where to go. I don't know what I'm supposed to be doing. That's what the disciples were, y'all. Yeah, yeah. They found love. Love walked with them and talked with them for three years. Love told them. Love instructed them. Love guided them. Love ate with them and slept with them. Love told them he loved them. Love did all these things to the disciples and yet they find themselves the day after he's resurrected. They found love and they don't know what to do with it. They don't know what to do with it. Some of you have been coming to church all your lives. You've been getting introduced to love. This kind of love. I'm not talking about the phileo love. No, no, I'm not talking about the brotherly love. No, I'm talking about the agape love. Yeah, that's bigger than what you've done in your past. It's the, it's the kind of love that covers up. All your old stuff and sees you for not what you are but your promise because that's what we do when we fall in love with somebody don't we fall in love with the promise of what they can be yeah yeah yeah, yeah. I told you before that's a good thing you can fall in love with somebody with the promise of how they be but that may not be a lasting love yeah yeah anybody in here that's been married for a long time or together with somebody for a long time knows that you fall in love because of something but you stay in love in spite of something yes sir yeah in spite of the fact that he or she has ABC qualities I still love them in spite of the fact that I can't use Jesus as an ATM machine so a lot of us think we're going to come to the Lord and think we're going to get riches untold. Suddenly he's going to give us everything we need. I love him in spite of that. Yeah, in spite of the fact that I have to, you know, I wear my shoes out because my paw on not angry. I have to go get them resold. I love them. You know, some of us think Jesus is supposed to give us a new pair of shoes every time they wear out. It doesn't work that way. But today we got an option, short message. The evidence is there. All the evidence is there. Jesus came. Jesus lived. Jesus died. Jesus was resurrected. Yeah, all of the information you need is right there. Love came just like he was promised. John. 316 said, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever, anybody in here in the whosoever family, whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Love came, Reggie. Love came and love loved us while he was here now that i found love gotta figure out what to do with it. gotta figure out how to deal with love in my life i gotta figure out whether love even has a place in my life yeah there are enough witnesses even starting immediately after the crucifixion after the resurrection he left enough clues to his existence. Nobody can reasonably walk around down here and say they don't know that there is a God and, and that, that Jesus was his son. Nobody can reasonably say that. You can say it, but it won't, it won't be reasonable. Let me tell you why. Because he left enough storytellers, enough witnesses to his mighty works. He healed enough folk. He fed enough folk. There were enough folk who marveled at the way he did things while he was alive. There were even folk who marveled at the way he died. But he didn't even let death stop him from showing that love was here. 
He immediately went to his disciples after he was resurrected. Immediately went and reassured them. Even the ones that turned their backs on him. Come here, Peter. Even those, boy, he gave a special message. I love how loving he is. He told Mary, he said, go tell the disciples. Go read it in scripture. He said, go tell the disciples and Peter. That's what it says in scripture. It's the same preacher who, uh, Peter who said, I'll never forsake you. I'll never forsake you. And Jesus looked at him with love in his eyes, and he said, you, before the cock crows three times, you will deny me thrice. And it came to pass that he denied him. And it put, I guarantee you, Peter got an immediate case of manic depression. He didn't know what to do. I found love. And I don't know what to do with him. And love came back and said, Mary, tell my disciples and Peter. If you, you never, those two words, and Peter, were enough to make Peter run for his life. For the rest of his life. Do everything he could to advance the kingdom of God. And when he got to the end, after they had tried to kill him so many different ways, they finally crucified him. Every one of them that found love ended up dying for love's sake. That's how they died, for love's sake. And when Peter died, they, they granted him, I mean, they crucified him. And he asked for one request when they crucified him. I'm not making this up. One request. He said, I want you to crucify me upside down because I'm not even worthy to die in the same position that Jesus died. And they granted his wish and hung him upside down when they crucified him. Now that you found love, what are you gonna do with it? There's two things, two things. Once you've got all of the information, you got two things you can do. It's simple. You got to review the evidence. Review the evidence. The evidence is there. The lawyer in me tells me. You don't need proof beyond any reasonable doubt. You simply need proof enough to convince yourself that he is who he says he is. Yeah. The travelers on the, let me, let, me, let, me, let me give it to you. This is why I read this scripture. The travelers on the road to Emmaus had all the information you needed. Amen. They had seen everything that went on with Jesus, eyewitnesses to it. They had seen it all. In fact, Reverend Johnson, they knew so much about it that they could tell other folk about it. Here comes a stranger, so they thought, walking down the road with them, and they told the whole story of what happened to Jesus. Just talking, that's true of a lot of us. A lot of us know how to tell other folks' stories. Right. Oh yeah, God been good to my mama. God did my mama good. God kept my mama. God brought my daddy through such and such. But you need to tell your own story. Yeah, that means your mama found God. That means your daddy found the Lord. But have you found the Lord? And if you have, what are you going to do with him? Yeah, yeah, I, I know you've been looking for a difference maker in your life. Um, I know you've been looking for somebody to get you over the hump. I know you've been trying to feel better, and you just can't make yourself feel better. But I've got news for you that love has been around all along. Love has been waiting on you to invest in him. Do you recognize him? Those men walking on the road, Cleophas was talking to Jesus and didn't recognize who he was. Cleophas was telling Jesus about his own crucifixion and resurrection and then realized, you know, it's a strange thing when somebody come tell you about your life. Knew enough to tell him what was going on in his life and yet couldn't see what was right before him. Couldn't see it. Maybe, maybe that's not the case. Maybe you're afraid. 
Maybe you found love, and like I said a few minutes ago, you just don't know how to take the next step. Maybe you're afraid that like the people who hurt you before, somebody who hurt you before, that this next love will do the same thing. And I got news for you. Every love affair involves a risk. You have to be willing to take a risk. The same chance you took on your first love is the same risk you have to take on your next love. You got somebody in the God spot of your life. You just need to make sure you got the right God there. Oh yeah, somebody is, you, 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 you worshiping somebody. You're worshiping somebody or you're worshiping something. I just came to ask you today, is it Jesus? If it's not Jesus, maybe it's your job. I, I, I don't know. I don't know what you're in love with, what you're spending your resources on, but I'm here to tell you that Jesus is the only one qualified to be an all-sufficient Savior. He's the only one. If you went on Mars and they had a position open that said all-sufficient Savior, couldn't nobody but Jesus put a resume in for that? Nobody else could qualify for that job but Jesus Christ. And here he stands. He's waiting on you just to open your heart and let him, let him come in. Maybe like Philip. Maybe you're not afraid. Maybe you've got him and you're eager to tell somebody like Philip in John chapter 1 verse 45. When Philip talked to Jesus, the first thing he did was went and got his brother. And he said, Nathaniel, come see. We have found the one they spoke of in the scripture. He was convinced. Now that you found love, what are you going to do with him? Have you been telling somebody? about Jesus Christ or did you just get the relationship? This ain't no pocket ro romance, is it? You're holding it back. Nobody knows you're in love with Jesus. N nobody knows that you and Jesus have a love affair going on. Is it one of those situations where you got to tell somebody? What are you going to do with it? It ain't no secret that you love Jesus. No, no, you got to tell somebody. Some of us get so comfortable in our walk we're so comfortable in it, and we think it's just personal. There's nothing about your walk that doesn't involve you witnessing to somebody else. You got to tell somebody how much you love Jesus. And so, two choices you got, and I'm out of here. The first choice is this. You can reject the information. You can reject it. That is your right. That is your right. <laughs> you can reject it. I love it. I love it. When I'm in, when one of the people who come to my courtroom, they hear me say all the time, people say, I want a trial. I say, fine. This is America, Jack. <laughs> you can have a trial. <laughs> I want you to have a trial. I said, but the police going to be here. The witness is going to be here. The stuff you stole going to be here. <laughs> you can have a trial. There's overwhelming evidence. But you can have a trial if you want to. You have a right to reject all the information you've received. That is your right as a person to see all the body of evidence, to hear all the testimonies. If I started today, I convened this as a courtroom, Brought witness after witness in. Come on up here, Maria, and tell me how good God has been to you. After Maria, come on, Fiatha, tell me how good God has been to you. Come on, come on, come on now, Pam, tell me. How good has God been to you? I could go on and on and bring every witness up here, and they could tell you how good God has been, and you can reject it if you want to. I, I don't have to go in the Bible. I can go because he's still falling in love with folk now. He's still taking care of his loved one right now. But you can reject it if you want to. Look, look, the, the Pharisees and the Sadducees did it. They saw all the stuff that Jesus was doing. And because it was going to mess up their lifestyle, they decided that they were going to reject him. And look, they said, they began, Luke 23 and 2, and they began to accuse him, saying, we found this fellow perverting the nation and forbidding to give tribute to Caesar, saying that he himself is Christ the, Christ the king. 
they came out against him because he was going to disturb the status quo in their life. Now, if you're okay with the status quo in your life, you comfortable with where you are, you got your eternity locked down, then you have a right to reject him. Oh yeah, you do. But I can tell you this right now. Once you pass through the gate from this life to the next, ain't no turning back. There's no turning back. There's no, uh-oh, I think I maybe should have taken advantage of that opportunity when I had it. Once you make the decision that I'm going to reject him, you're making a decision that has eternal consequences. All right. Now, you may assume, well, I live to be old and gray. And, and I'll see how things go 20 years from now. And, I, and, and then I'll let him into my life. Now, 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 you assume too much. Because he may say to you, like he said to the rich young ruler, thou fool. This day, your soul is required of thee. Oh yeah, there's no promise that we'll live beyond the moment. That there's no promise that, that pain you feel might be that burrito you ate, or it could be the end. You never know. You take for granted what's going on in your life. You think because you're young, you got plenty of years ahead of you. And I came to tell you today, the evidence is right there before you. You can accept it the way it's been put out there, or you have the right to reject it. Look what Jesus said. Jesus wasn't mute on this issue. He told John to write this. Jesus, in chapter 12, verse 44, said, Then Jesus cried, Whoever believes in me does not believe in me only, but in the one who sent me. The one who looks at me is seeing the one who sent me. I have come into the world as a light that no one who believes in me should stay in darkness. If anyone hears my words but does not keep them, I do not judge that person. For I did not come to judge the world but to save the world. He said, but there is a judge for the one who rejects me and does not accept my words. The very words I have spoken will condemn them at the last day. For I did not speak on my own, but the Father who sent me commanded me to say all that I have spoken. I'm standing here today just like Jesus Christ said, if you reject what I'm saying, you're not rejecting me, you're rejecting the one who sent me. It's my job to tell you about love. It's your job to accept love. It's my job to tell you that love lives, that love still lives, that love wants to be in a relationship with you. That's my job. When I sit down from this sermon, I've done my job. You got to ask the question, now that i found love, what am I going to do with him? And people say, is that correct? Gonna. What am I gonna? Gonna. I looked it up, you know, made sure I was using something that was appropriate in the English language. And it's, of course, it's a transliteration of the word going to. It's true transliteration of that word going to but when you use it in the context of a sentence gonna means something uh, in the imperative something in the future so once you have heard it what are you going to for those of you who have to be grammatically correct what are you going to do with it you can reject it or the last thing is you can receive it yeah, you can reject the information or you can receive the invitation. Look, John, 
The one who called himself the beloved disciple wrote this as well. Yet to all who did receive him. I love this. I love this because, see, I was born in Elanian City. I was born in Elanian City. And um, I was born to an 18-year-old unwed mother. Truth of the matter is I met my father, my biological father, when I was about 25 years old. Never knew him. Never knew him. Now, I was raised by Cedric Sparks, and he raised me. He did a good job. All right? So I didn't miss a figure in the house, but not the man who made me. All right? Not the man who made me. Met him when I was 25 years old. And if circumstances had been such that that gave me a complex, and God surrounded me with enough good folk that that didn't happen, no, no, I knew I was loved. I knew I was loved. If didn't nobody love me, I knew the folk at 3701, 43rd Avenue North in Elanian City loved me. I knew that, and that was my grandmom and granddaddy's house, and if didn't nobody else love me, I knew the folk in 1317, 18th Street Southwest. That was my mama and daddy's house. I knew my grandparents loved me. I knew my folk loved me. I didn't have that problem, but if you're sitting in here, and you didn't grow up with that kind of blessing, knowing that somebody loved you. If you needed a name to go with your name, if you needed a face to go with the name you got, if you needed somebody to be there for you, to teach you how to do all the things, if you've been looking for that kind of love, I got news for you. Love is here. This is what love said. Love said, to those who receive him, to those who believe in his name, he gave you the right to become children of God. My goodness. I don't have to worry about nobody down here to call my daddy. I got a daddy who created everything. I got a father who sits high and takes care of me. That's the kind of love I got in my life. The one who can take care of not just me, but everybody around me. That's the kind of love. I got in my life. Yeah, yeah. He said, children born not of natural descent. That's what gets us messed up. Yeah. Nor of human decision. Or maybe I should say indecision. Because that's how a lot of folk get here. Not from decision. But from indecision. Yeah, from uh-oh. That's how a lot of folk get here. Yeah, yeah, you were an afterthought. Or uh, 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 what you talking about? Or uh, what? That, that's how you came here. Yeah, and so if you depended on that to come in and support you as your father, some of us have run into some trouble. Yeah, but this scripture says, not of natural descent, nor of human decision or a husband's will, but born of God. I've been reborn. No longer am I Andre Daniel Jones, Andre Daniel Sparks. I'm Andre God's son. My Lord. You know you walk differently when you know who your folk are. When you know where you come from, you can put a little strut in your walk. Yeah, when you're not concerned, when you don't have to bow your head because you think you come from somebody that don't nobody know about, you can hold your head up high. In fact, you can go around telling other folk how good your daddy is. You can preach about it. That's what comes from being in a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. You can receive the invitation. Same invitation I took comes to you as well. Yeah. Have you ever watched the postman go down the street? When they have one of those bundles. How many postmen I got in here? <laughs> yeah, right here. Y'all go down the street and y'all have those mass mailings. And you can go down the street and you can see the same little blue envelope on everybody's door. All right? That's how it is with this. The invitation that Jesus Christ gave is on everybody's door. It's available to everybody. No. He delivered it to everyone. Not just to certain people. But to everyone, you have a right to accept this invitation. 
I like this about love. Love didn't sit there and wait on me to find him. Love came looking for me. Love came and found me. And when love found me, he stayed on me. Even though I ignored him for a while, he was persistent about getting me. He didn't want to let me go. He said, Andre, I know you're worth keeping. And so he kept on, kept on knocking. And finally it got to the point that I couldn't ignore that love loved me better than me. And I gave myself. I gave myself to love. And it's made all the difference in my life. You got a choice to make today. After you receive all this information, you got a right to reject it or you can accept or receive this invitation. Look at this, look at this. Of all the four major world religions, only one defies the odds. I just want to clear the air on you right here in case you got some speculation, all right? All of them, except one, conclude in a different way. All right, all of them. Of the four major religions, they all are based on personalities rather than philosophies. Yeah, all of them. All of them are based on personalities, not, philo not just philosophies. Look at this. But only Christianity claims a significant difference than the other three. Look at this. In 1900 BC, Judaism's father, Abraham, died. That's what the scripture said. 1900 BC, father Abraham slept with his fathers. All right. In 483 BC, the Buddhist writings say that Buddha died with the, other, with the utter passing away in which, and this is what the writing says, with that utter passing away in which nothing whatever remains behind. They didn't leave any doubt that Buddha died, left nothing behind. On June 6th, 632 A.D., Muhammad, the prophet, died. Their writings tell us that that's the exact date and time that he died. In 13, I mean in 33 A.D., Jesus Christ died. But none of the other religions have a but. None of the other religions have a footnote. None of the other religions have an add-on. Abraham died and stayed dead. Buddha died and stayed dead. Muhammad died and stayed dead. But my Bible, my teaching, my life tells me that Jesus died. But he didn't stay dead. Three days later, Three days later, three days later, love came back again. And the difference maker is this, he, li he yet lives. He's still alive. He's still loving people. He's still helping people. Do you know him? Now that you found love, what are you going to do? with it. I'm inviting you to become a part of love's family. He's been looking for you. He's been searching for you. He's been out knocking on doors, following you. You could probably get a stalking warrant on him. He's been on you. Are you ready, ready to give your life to him? He's standing there and let me tell you, he's not going anywhere. He's going to continue extending himself to you. Won't you accept him? Today is the today. Today is the day. People, people say, Reverend Sparks, will you beg somebody to be in the body of Christ? And the answer is yes. Absolutely, I beg somebody to be in the body of Christ because they don't understand that the decision they make has eternal consequences. Reject me. Look, look, reject Andre. Don't, don't like Andre. 
I can take that. Yeah, say, I don't like the way Reverend Sparks preaching. That's fine. But, but don't reject him. Don't, don't push him back. Don't tell him no. Tell me no. But don't tell him no. Accept what he's offering you. It's the gift of eternal life. Now's the opportunity for you to come. The brothers have come. We've extended an invitation. Maybe you've never accepted him for the first time. Today is the day. Cameron did it. Cameron did it last Sunday. And we welcome him into the body of Christ immediately. Today is your day. Maybe you've been a part of another church family and you've been looking around trying to find an opportunity to find a church that fits you. I'm asking you to try us. I'm asking you to give us a try. Today is the day. As the choir stands to sing a song, the doors of our church are wide open. Whosoever will, let them come right now. Whosoever will. Well, there you have it. My prayer is that this sermon, this message has been a blessing to you. If you desire more information about 45th Street or any information you need about the Lord, I invite you to visit us at our website, 45bc.org, or come see us in our church, in our church home at 7600 Division Avenue. Again, my name is Andre Sparks, and I can't wait to see you so you can find out why we're striving to be the friendliest church from the parking lot to the pulpit. God bless you. Take care.